Welcome to Building the Future, hosted by Kevin Horick. With millions of listeners a month, Building the Future has quickly become one of the fastest rising programs with a focus on interviewing startups, entrepreneurs, investors, CEOs, and more. The radio and TV show airs in 15 markets across the globe, including Silicon Valley. For full show times, past episodes, or to sponsor the show, please visit buildingthefutureshow.com. Welcome back to the show. Today we have John Ruby. He's the CEO at Ruby Entertainment. John, welcome back to the show. Hey, Kevin. How are you, buddy? I'm, I'm very well. I'm really, really excited to have you back on the show. You, you did it a while ago um, for kind of the 10th annual MEAs. I'm excited to have you back for to talk about kind of the 11th annual MEAs. And I'm also really, really excited to talk to you about some of the projects that you're currently working on because selfishly i'm fascinated in the technology that you get to play with and use all the time so so john welcome back kevin it's it's great to be here awesome man so for people that don't know who you are maybe do you want to give a quick background on yourself and uh what exactly ruby entertainment is so i uh i'm a producer uh at heart i've uh spent my entire life slash career uh, in entertainment, uh, in entertainment and, and events. Um, I, you know, started booking bands in high school and That's awesome. ran the activities, uh, uh, you know, program for college and, uh, you know, have always been focused on, uh, uh, new technology, new monetization strategies and, um, you know, just how do we uh, enhance uh, the audience uh, experience sure. and uh, the return to the content uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the, the more capital that gets returned, the more content that can be created. So interesting. that's kind of what I do. Sure. So do you want to walk us through some of your kind of past projects? Because you've done some huge stuff for some huge brands and celebrities. Yeah, I did uh, you know, the global distribution strategy and execution for uh, Live 8. Uh, uh, I did uh, Operation MySpace live from Kuwait. Wow. Um, we shot uh, 63 bands in 3D, um, wow. basically at festivals. Sure. Created the largest 3D concert performance library. Um, I, I did, uh, Bon Jovi, uh, events when I was at AEG, um, wow. did a, a, ma- a massive number of festivals, including, uh, British summertime, uh, in London, uh, several years. I did the first two years of the global citizen festival. I did wow. Lollapalooza. Wow. I did Austin city limits, right. uh, New Orleans jazz and heritage festival for six years. You know, I mean, we had a lot of fun, and 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 what was really uh, fun about it was, you know, working with uh, uh, great events uh, that are run by uh, great people um, that are all focused on making sure that the audience uh, has an extraordinary experience, as uh, uh, as does the artist. Um, and there's, you know, there's a lot of T's to cross and I's to dot in there, but. But um, that, you know, really, that's at the heart of what I love to do. And uh, I was able to, you know, experiment uh, uh, with brand new technologies. I mean, we were the first ones, uh, as I said, you know, to do 3D. We were the first ones uh, to do on-site streaming. We were the first ones uh, to uh, uh, adapt the uh, H.265 um Kodak, um, you know, glo- uh, global distribution and things. And, you know, just uh, how do you, uh, in essence, bend and then break the rules uh, in order to serve uh, a larger audience and a higher purpose uh, with a better product? Yeah, interesting. Because that your career is always kind of fascinated me because you basically – get to play with the stuff that a lot of people 
hope to get to play with one day, right? And you guys have kind of always been playing with that stuff and using it at these big events that, you know, most people have kind of heard of, right? Or, or have been to at some right. point in their life. Well, I, I, yeah, and I think that, that if you want to come down to uh, the core of, well, how do you do that? Well, it's basically um, we're, we're, we're um, able to make a business case that this makes sense, that we can deliver uh, on this uh, technology or this particular distribution strategy or, you know, whatever the new premise is, we can make that happen um, because we have uh, basically done all the preparation, we have the experience, and we're, we're, we're in essence prepared for things that don't necessarily work. I mean, the other thing, if you, if you look at it, you know, <laughs> We we did uh, uh, Greenfield, uh, uh, you know, basically um, capturing uh, and distributing these events um, from venues that that are basically you know grassy fields and right. whether it's uh, you know um, uh, the Kuwaiti desert uh, from Camp Bering yeah, or right. uh, Hyde Park in London or you know um, and any one of uh, uh, we did uh, Rock and Rio and. Rio as well as uh, in Lisbon. So, you know, it's, it's, it's all about doing your homework sure. in essence, knowing uh, uh, what the needs of the audience, the artist and um, the content are and, and uh, in essence, finding the best uh, way to connect the two. Sure. But how do you prepare for some of these huge events when, in a lot of cases, some of this stuff hasn't really been done before. Are you there at the actual place weeks before trying oh, to set up and test it? Okay. Well, I, I don't know that you need to be there weeks before, but okay. you're definitely working on it Okay. weeks before. And I think that, you know, part of it is also setting everyone's expectations. You right. don't shy away from the hard questions. Okay. It's like anything else in life or business. You know, you you need to face up to the to the hard questions. You need to uh, look at the uh, uh, the pluses and the minuses. And you know, if you've done the proper preparation, then you you will be able to execute uh, through a number of different uh, strategies when some stuff works and other stuff doesn't. Sure. Yeah. No, that makes sense, right? And it that's is quite fascinating to me um I, I guess it's it sounds so daunting right but i guess if you break it down into simple chunks and you figure out how to solve the hardest problems first it becomes less daunting is that fair to say oh totally well and and look you have to be honest with yourself yeah, as okay. well as everybody else sure you know what i mean so so at the end of the day it's it's not about you know screaming from the uh, highest mountaintop, wow, well, we're going to do this. No, <laughs> no we, you know, we're actually laying out a, a strategy and a plan that in essence everybody can buy into and they all know where their place is. And, you know, in particular, you encourage everyone around you. I mean, this is really important. Is you have to make everyone feel secure that they can tell you what they are most worried about. Interesting. That, that, so in essence, that way in their being able to share it, one, that makes them feel that much more comfortable about it. And secondly, you can, you, you know, you can uh, make your own determination as to, wow, I hadn't thought about that. We got to figure that out. Or, uh, yeah, no, we're good. Uh, and because of A, B, C, and D. So, Sure. But how do you as the CEO that's running all this stuff, actually make your employees feel open enough to actually tell you their biggest fears? Because I think as a leader, sometimes people feel like they can't actually be 100% honest with you. Yeah, but I think that, that I don't know that that person is necessarily a leader. Oh, interesting. You know, sure. maybe more of a dictator or a bully. Okay. Um, but I think, you know, I, I learned very early in my career, uh, I was at a, um, 
at a planning meeting. It was actually for a Broadway show. And okay. one of the producers walked out. He said, hey, everybody, you know, uh, I'm here. And uh, I want you all to know that um, my job is to enable you to do your best work. Okay, interesting. And I can't do my job unless I know, one, what you're really excited about, and two, what you're concerned about. Interesting. So the only mistake you can make with me is not telling me what you're concerned about, because I can't help you with what I don't know. Sure. No, I, I think that's really good advice, right? But I think I've just heard that from a few people before where sometimes they feel like, yeah, but that's interesting if they're, yeah, it's their problem, not really necessarily the employee's problem, right? It's People are scared to them. Yeah, interesting. I just don't know that that, that particularly, I, I mean, I could get it if you're, you know, a bunch of layers right. away from that person. But in particular, if if you're, what do they call it? One degree of separation. Yeah. And you're still, you still can't bring uh, the information to the attention of someone that can make the change. Sure. And that doesn't work. I, and that's not an entertainment. It, I think that's life in general. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. No, that's, that's really good advice. A anything else that you've learned over the years that you think, you know, other people should, should learn because this is interesting. Well, you never get in trouble with your ears. <laughs> so be sure to listen. Yeah. Interesting. Um, no, I think that, that, you know, I, I don't know, do what you love with people that you love and life is really good. So have you used a lot of the same, um, people over the years because you, you kind of know and trust them or are you always dealing with kind of a new team or is it a bit of a mixed bag? It, well, it's a mixed bag yeah, because, okay. you know, in particular, uh, you got geography, you yeah. got budget, you got relationships. I mean, one of the, one of the ways that, uh, um, I, I've been able to work with a whole, uh, bunch of different artists and events and stuff is, you know, I'm, uh, totally open and willing to work with people that already have a relationship and bring in essence, my toolkit to the table. Got you. Um, I, you know, I don't, uh, there, there are others, um, that in essence come in with their entire team or none at all. Right. And that's, um, that's not been my strategy. Interesting. Okay. No, that and I, you, I, meet, you know, you meet, you meet new people sure. and you learn new things. Sure. Yeah, that's fair. And then obviously, as you've just been in the industry, new people are coming and going all the time, right? And and moving to LA and right. moving outside of LA. Yeah. Interesting. And you know, I think the other thing that, you know, people may say, well, you know, you got to be careful of that, because ultimately, you're responsible. And that's true. Mm -hmm. That's true, you know, but by the same token, you know, yeah, you know, it, 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 it might not go um, the way you expected, but that could be a really good thing because it could be better than you expected because you learn new uh, ways to do it sure. that make it better than, than it would have been if you, in essence, hadn't been exposed to new people and new ideas. Yeah, interesting. So do you guys basically have a warehouse of gear that you call on all the time or do you rent gear all, for, for no, a lot of the events? No, rent gear. Rent yeah. gear. It's kind of what I expected because your gear was probably outdated, what, every six months or every year maybe? Well, you know <laughs> you know what they say, uh, the gear you bought yesterday is today's doorstop. Yeah, fair. Yeah, okay. That's kind you of You know, there's always a newer, faster, shinier. Now, you know, it's different if – let's say, you know, you're going to basically put uh, equipment in place and you're going to run it uh, for, you know, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year or sure. something like that. That's a different application. Right. But basically, you know, what I do uh, is generally live, live. Right. You know, because a lot of people find that risky, dangerous. Yeah. All that stuff. But I, I find that, you know, empowering. <laughs> Interesting. And, it you would know, freak it, me it, out. <laughs> it, it keeps me young, you know. So, um, 
uh, and, but but by the same token, you know, uh, and you know the the willingness to um, adopt new technologies and the like, you know, there's manufacturers that'll give you access to those uh, to that technology before it becomes mainstream. Uh, in essence, just to get proof of concept so they can help sell it. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, and that's. That, that's got to be fun, though, to be able to play with the new stuff. But I also assume that because you've been in the industry so long, it, it's just kind of incremental changes, right? Like once you understand, uh, uh, this is a, probably a bad example, but like once you understand how to work a camera, sure, the new one might be a little bit different, but it's basically the same, fair to say. And, and that's with a lot of technology, if you've been in it for so well, long. Well, uh, no, I mean, no? it depends okay. upon... I mean, when 3D came along sure. and you had, you know... <laughs> Sure. You know, basically, you had two you had two lenses oh, that had to be constantly synced, and you know, uh, when you get into um, higher frame rates and uh, you know, um, oh, two uh, K, four K, you know, and, and above, um, you you know, you have uh, far more um, digital storage requirements and. Right the speed of processing and all those things, you know, you got to figure all that stuff out. Sure. Interesting. Yeah. So how long does it typically take for you guys to figure some of that new stuff out? Like you must have to just rent gear and play with it is, or how else do you do that? Well, you're, you're constantly going out to trade shows. Ah, uh, Okay. Interesting. And looking at what's coming. So you're doing a lot of research on your own time then. Well, yeah. Cause I'm curious. Sure. At the end of the day, you know, I, I'm I'm curious. I <laughs> yeah, I know, get it. I'm I the enjoy, same way with technology, uh, so I get it. Right. So you know, um, and it and it's so much the better, you know, if you don't have to go out and buy all that stuff uh, before you find out whether or not it works. Sure. No, I guess that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Fair. So you're involved in the Infinity Film Festival in Beverly Hills, November first to the fourth. What exactly right. is it, and how did you get involved with that? Well, it's it's at the you know um, intersection of technology, content, um, and the city of Beverly Hills, which uh, you may or may not know is the sister city to Cannes. Um, oh, when I, I first know. heard about it, yeah, yeah, uh, you know, it was uh, the fact that. Uh, Beverly Hills and Con are sister cities, plus the fact that uh, it's in November. Sure. So, you know, it, it, in particular, it's right up in front of the Christmas, you know, film season. Right. And really, you know, you, you, you probably haven't had, well, what did you have? You had Toronto in uh, September. Right. You've had... Uh, uh, tell you ride, uh, you know, in the summer, but there really isn't anything, uh, rolling into, uh, Christmas. So, uh, I mean, that got my attention that I, w I went to, I knew the, the guys that were setting it up from okay. the, uh, international 3d society. And so I had worked with them on some of their projects and, um, they invited me to come out to an organizational meeting. And I saw that Intel and uh, um, AMD were both at the table. Um, yeah, and, and you know, you just you kind of pay attention to things like that. And so they asked me to uh, join their board and um, help them put together some panels um, and uh, co-chair music. Very. And cool. so here we are, one week from today. Yeah, very cool. No, the thing that's interesting about um, this festival, at least, is there's a bunch of gaming studios involved, and you guys have a, a section about blockchain, and which oh yeah, all that stuff isn't traditionally thought of when you think film festival. So, do you maybe want to talk about kind of the combination or, or how these industries are kind of coming together and and maybe not becoming one, but at least working heavily together now, where I think in for a lot of years they were pretty separate. Is that fair to say? Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, well, the opening night party, um, 
in, you know, includes a preview of CES 2019. Interesting. So it's all about, you know, the intersection of technology and content. Sure. And the other thing that you'll find is that, you know, as I said, you've got a music panel, you've got a faith-based panel, you've got, uh, um, there's a special screening of uh, Woody Harrelson's Lost in London, which was the first live filming, one camera, one take, live from the streets of London into movie theaters in the United States, which won the uh, British Production Guild, you know, uh, best event of the year. Um, so all of these, in essence, uh, niche areas, uh, uh, in essence can be showcased because, you know, CinemaCon and the, and Con and the bigger shows don't necessarily go after, um, the niches. Right. But I think in particular, as technology grows, everything's a niche, you know, with the possible exception of hundred million dollar features. Sure. Um, you know, what, what is, uh, Netflix and Hulu and, and the new Disney streaming service. And those are all in essence, niche audiences that, uh, are finding, uh, a home to, uh, help satiate their content appetite. Interesting. Well, and I think the other thing too, about doing it in Beverly Hills is you're very close to the tech scene. And there's a huge tech scene in kind of Los Angeles, uh, the the Silicon Beach thing that it's been declared. And then obviously you have a huge entertainment focus. And then you also have the gaming companies, right? So you have this uh, mash of people all within a pretty close range, right? Within driving distance of, you know, maybe an hour of each other that can all right. kind of collaborate on this these things, right? Which is... I, I don't really know. There's probably other places in the world that are like that, but I think Beverly Hills is kind of the center of that, right? Is it fair to say? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's literally where a lot of the talent, you know, uh, from an artistic, from a creative, from a technical uh, perspective, it's where a lot of people live. Sure. Yeah. Or at least are coming to every, at least right. once a year, right? Well, and that's the other thing about it is, you know, that it's right around the time of year uh, for the AFM, you know, the American right. film market, which happens in Santa Monica right around the same time period. So, yes, you you not only have, uh, in essence, local and regional people coming in, but you have people from all over the world coming in um, to, in essence, show their uh, films and features and sell them at the AFM. Interesting. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. So I'm curious, though, to get your thoughts on how you see the industry or these industries coming together kind of now and then any future predictions for for some of this stuff, because it's quite fascinating how there's this convergence of digital and actually film shot, and then they combine them later, which they've been doing for a long time. But I think with kind of some of the augmented reality stuff, some of the gaming stuff, uh, obviously the quality of the stuff's getting better. Do you want to maybe talk about some of the innovations that you've seen or you think are coming? Well, like I say, I think that, that we're, you know, um, if you look at theatrical, okay. um, the industry has made an enormous uh, investment, you know, in particular exhibition has substantially improved the experience with recliners, upscale food, you know, uh, better digital pictures and, and, uh, you know, um, 12 plus channel, uh, audio systems and the like. So, so the, the experience in the theater is extraordinary as well as the, uh, on the, um, uh, creative slash studio side, you have these, massive budgets, you know, uh, sure. going into content creation. So all of that's, you know, really a good thing. Um, but you also have, uh, an enormous, uh, um, almost voracious appetite, um, with people, um, streaming and consuming the content that they want 
in the format that they wanted, you know, at the uh, on the device they want, at the time they want. They, in essence, they can choose their own experience. And in particular, it's this uh, massive um, explosion of technology that enables all of that to be possible. Sure. And, the, and that, I think, you know, creates an even greater economic opportunity for everyone involved in the ecosystem. So you get, you know, happier fans, uh, you know, enjoying more, better content um, at the time, place, and atmosphere that they're looking for. Yeah, interesting. The other thing that's fascinating about the whole space is the geographic or where you're located geographically doesn't necessarily mean you can experience something almost like you're there in person. Fair to say? Oh, yeah. I, I mean, look, uh, you're going to see substantial growth in terms of uh, holographic, virtual reality, right? Um, you know, um, uh, AI, augmented reality. Uh, all of those pieces, you know, are going to create new uh, user experiences, if you will. And um, I think that uh, um, that, you know, again, it's it's just going to make the uh, um, the pool bigger so more people can swim, right? Sure. But how do you the, – the technical challenges of some of that stuff, especially doing it live – must be insane because if you have to send it to, you know, my, my living room TV, my web browser, my phone, AI, or say, sorry, like my VR headset and maybe a handful of other devices, that's got to be a lot of prep and planning and figuring it out. Right. Right. But if you look at, I was at a, um, speech that Steve Wozniak uh, gave, okay. um, you know, I don't know, in the last year or so. Okay. And he was talking about the fact he was basically holding his uh, uh, Apple smartphone. Yeah. And, you know, he was mentioning um, that, uh, you know, I guess around the time that we were born. Okay. Um the the, uh, the computing power that he was holding in his hand would have filled a large room. Yeah, which is wild, right? Right. So, you know, and 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 literally, you've got companies like uh, Intel and AMD and such that are creating um, chips sure. that have more processing power that are in that entire phone. Yeah, it's interesting. Thanks for listening to Building the Future. This show is heard by more than a million people monthly in over 15 markets worldwide, including Silicon Valley. Kevin Horick's guests are leading business owners, successful entrepreneurs, and merchandisers worldwide. Now, your brand has an opportunity to tap into this dedicated and active group of business people who are looking for places to invest and the right opportunities to support. Find out how you can get involved at buildingthefutureshow.com. Yeah, no, it, it's quite fascinating to me. And and I think, too, some of these gaming companies, even the little films they create in between game scenes or at the beginning of a game are, are pretty epic little films, right? Right. Oh, I, look, I, you know, um, when I was running Fathom, okay. we were doing faith-based events okay. that, you know, like Dropbox and, right. and Brian Ivey's going to be uh, – you know, he's going to be talking about it uh, on the event cinema panel, and then he's going to be talking about his new film, uh, documentary film, Emmanuel, uh, on a faith-based uh, day. Okay. Um, and, and, you know, in particular, those are 2 and $3 million films. Wow. At the box office, just in theatrical. That's before you get to downstream. Okay, interesting. Wow. And then, and then, you know, we've got uh, we've got David Brand uh, from CBN talking about the marketing of uh, in our hands, and uh, Gordon Robertson is one of our keynotes uh, 
he is the keynote uh, for the faith-based uh, day, um, and he'll be talking about all the multi-platform initiatives uh, that CBN uh, is doing, including their 24-hour news service and, um, you know, all of the uh, all the online and the Superbook uh, digital animated series that's coming out. I mean, you know, and, and that's that is clearly a, uh, a niche audience, but it's a it's an audience that is very committed and passionate about uh, uh, their content and their stories. Yeah, well, and I think that's the beauty of any of this stuff is you could basically find content that's tailored almost exactly to you and the types of things that you're interested right. in, right? Exactly. Well, I, I, look, I was, I was reading, uh, I was looking online last night and, um, I've been looking at, you know, different ways to stream 4k. Okay. And, um, you know, um, there's a, a fair number of, uh, what would you call it, uh, traditional uh, TV providers, um, okay. cable and satellite that require new equipment and this, that, and the other. And so, you know, you go looking at it because you, you want to see as much really good stuff on your 4K screen as you can. Sure. And one guy, you know, just really hit <laughs> You know, he he, he kind of spoke to me and he said, uh, you know, after I looked at all of it, uh, I'm just going to stream it. It's all easier to, you know, get it off my uh, off my computer and, and put it on the screen. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. Interesting. It is. And, and that's, in essence, where I think the the whole move toward, uh, you know, streaming TV, if you will. You know, you got YouTube and and Amazon and Hulu and everybody's offering these live TV bundles right. basically, which is a way to get sports yeah. you know, into the mix. Um, and you know, they're, they're also starting to look at higher format, uh, uh, presentation. And, you know, if you go back to 3d, pretty much the 3d business went to, uh, 3d Blu-rays. You know, yeah. DirecTV tried to support it, but, you know, in, in their mind, it just wasn't a big enough market. And so it went to another device. And you could uh, you could definitely see that uh, with the millennials already moving toward uh, streaming choices uh, for what people would consider 3D. So then you could also see the, uh, the higher frame rate and um, higher resolution formats. Um, you know, living and streaming and, and not really becoming a mainstream um, box-driven device. Yeah, interesting. I, I agree. I, I think more and more people are just going online and, and getting content streamed to them because I think more and more people just want to pick a show or movie and they want to watch it in the highest possible quality instantly and they don't care who made it or where it's coming from. Have you found that as well? Um, yeah, I think that, that, uh, particularly if you, if you look at millennials and below, I mean, they're, they're definitely streaming on their own devices. Sure. At their own pace. Yeah. Um, it, like it doesn't matter if it comes from Netflix or Hulu or HBO. Like I, I want to watch this show, this movie now, right? Just give right, it to me. Exactly on my device and then I want to pick up another I want to pause it on this device and go pick it up on another device right I do that all the time correct yeah and, and literally I mean what's the secret to success in business find a need and fill it yeah don't it's tell simple. people what you think they need you know because people more than more than ever are very clear about what they want sure. what they'll pay for it and, and, you know, all of that. And so all you need to do is pay attention and fulfill. Sure. And it seems like the entertainment industry, even the people that, I, I guess for lack of a better term, kind of waited to adopt some of this new technology, I, I think most of them, if not all of them now, realize they need to be streaming their content. Fair to say? Yes. And Absolutely. Well, I mean, the, the, the reality is the, most of the stats say, that the streaming uh, 
the numbers and the time have never been higher. Interesting. Now, the reality is that, that uh, as you start to drill down on those numbers, I saw an article recently that said that Netflix, that 80% of the streaming comes from 20% of the content. Uh, um, and, and, and an overwhelming amount of that is licensed content, not the new. But maybe it takes longer to, you know, um, have the new uh, content find an audience. Yeah, but you also think part of that problem is, because I find this sometimes, you can spend 20 minutes searching through Netflix to find something to watch, and then you're almost over it, right? Where sometimes you want right. something to just say, you know what, I'm just going to pick from these 50 channels, right? And just watch something. Have you exactly. found that? Yeah, well, I think that, you know, in, in particular, again, like uh, like I say, the... Um, Let's just use YouTube TV as an sure. example. That's, yeah. I think, 60 channels. Yeah. But it's probably got more sports in it. Yeah, it does, because I have it. I... Than what I've... So, so there you go. And if there's a channel that you don't, in essence, that isn't in the bundle, yeah. you can easily access that channel directly. Yeah, totally. So in essence, you can build your own bundle and it, it depends on, you know, what do you want to use as your base? Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I, I think more and more it, it's just going down to I like this channel's content and I'm willing to pay for it and I'm just going to watch it, right, on demand. And I'm going right. to watch one episode or a whole season in a afternoon, right? Exactly. So Yeah, and, and, and you know, that's that's created a whole – different content experience you know because uh really up until what would you say three years ago sure people were trained to basically wait week by week yeah which is weird uh, now. To, right because uh basically the uh, <laughs> you know the majority of the audience is like you say you know wants to consume it uh in an evening or a weekend sure yeah, interesting. So you've also been heavily involved in the Media Excellence Awards since the beginning. Do you want to talk about your involvement with the Media Excellence Awards and, and how you originally got involved and why you've stayed involved for so long? Well, I think that, you know, um, Sarah is really bold sure. in her vision and she has evolved uh, really ahead of the market okay. in terms of the incorporation of, you know, she started with mobile right. and then as, as uh, mobile morphed into multi-platform, you know, she evolved with it. And, uh, but, but the idea of, in essence, um, recognizing and, 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 um, rejoicing in great content and great um, technology that enables that content uh, worldwide, you know, in, in the fact that what are we, we're in our 11th year, right? Yep. So, um, I mean, that's pretty extraordinary. And so I feel it's a blessing just uh, to be able to support her uh, in any way I can. Sure. So for people that maybe haven't heard of the Media Excellence Awards, what exactly is it? And why do you think it's been so important and people keep asking her to do it? Well, like I say, I think that it's, it's you know, it brings together content, technology, sure. um, and uh, in essence, multi-platform. Um, and she uh, is... Um, she, she's uh, much broader in her vision, if you will, in sure. terms of, uh, you know, she looks at short to short form uh, oh, trailer or ad uh, advertising style. Right. Uh, she looks at, uh, you know, in particular, I've been fortunate to win um, the uh, Humanitarian Award, cool. uh, you know, which is really about, um, in, in essence, the message and the purpose of the content. Right. Um, and, 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 you know, that's 
that's quite humbling when you think about it. Sure. Um, so, I, you know, I, I think it's the fact that she is able to take, in essence, all these uh, little nuggets and um, every year she creates this massive gold bar you know, by right, bringing right. them all together. And, uh, you know, like I say, it's, it's, it's technology, it's content, it's um, multi-platform, and it's global. Yeah. Well, and it's nice, too, because people from all over the globe get recognized for, for creating right. this stuff, right? Where, obviously, there's huge award shows for movie and television and, and other things, but there's not really an award show other than kind of the Media Excellence Awards that actually celebrates people building technology and, and things around technology to improve the lives of either their clients, their customers, or kind of the world. Fair to say? Correct. Absolutely. Couldn't have said it better myself. So you've had a bunch of different roles there because you were on the board for a while. Or are you still on the board at the Media Excellence Awards? Certainly at the advisory board. Sure. Um, I think that, you know, there's a group of us between myself and Daniel Tibbetts right. and... Uh, JPR and um, Scott Holmes, yeah. um, you know, that, that have kind of been around. And Allison Dollar's been, yeah. uh, you know, Sarah's uh, right hand uh, forever. So, um, and, and you know, I think that uh, we've met an enormous number of uh, awesome people. Um, and, and, you know, we just, we just feel that... Uh, uh, we're all uh, very grateful uh, to be part of the experience. Sure. No, I, that makes a lot of sense. But, uh, John, we're kind of coming to the end of the show. So do you want maybe want to close with mentioning where people can get more information about yourself and Ruby Entertainment? Yes. If you go to uh, rubyentertainment.com, um, you know, you'll find uh, out all about me and how to reach me. And uh, if you've got ideas, uh, I'd love to hear from you. I'm at uh, john at rubyentertainment.com. And uh, you can also check out the uh, Beverly Hills Infinity Film Festival, which is uh, infinityfilmfestival.com. And uh, Kevin, what's the uh, what's the MEAs? It's media, the letter x and then awards.com and just so people know how to spell ruby it's r-u-b-e-y entertainment.com you're you're correct again (laughs) well john as always i enjoyed talking with you and thanks again for doing it and uh have a good rest of your day man thanks uh for inviting me it's uh it's an honor and a privilege to be part of your show Thank you, Kevin. I appreciate that, and I'm looking forward to seeing you in uh, January again in person. Wouldn't miss it. Thank (laughs) you. Thanks, man. Okay. See you. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. Thanks for listening. Please visit our website at buildingthefutureshow.com to join the free community, sign up for our newsletter, or to sponsor the show. The music is done by Electric Mantra. You can check him out at electricmantra.com and keep building the future.